Good morning and welcome to the 20th meeting of Session 6 of the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee. We have received apologies for, today from Bill Kidd, MSP and Jeremy Balfour, MSP. So before we move to the first item on the agenda, I would like to remind everyone present to switch mobile phones to silent. And the first item of business is a declaration of interests. In accordance with Section 3 of the Code of Conduct, I invite Colin Beattie, MSP and Stephen Kerr, MSP to declare any interests relevant to the remit of the committee. So I invite each member in turn to declare any interests. So first of all, Colin Beattie. I have no interest to declare other than those that are already declared in my register of interest. Okay, thank you, Colin. Uh, and Stephen? Yeah, I do not have any uh, relevant uh, interests uh, to declare in relation to the work of the committee. Thanks very much, Stephen. <clears throat> the next item of business is to decide whether to take items 7, 8 and 9 in private. Is the committee content to take these items in private? Yeah, thank you. Thank you. So moving to agenda item number three today, we're taking evidence from George Adam, MSP, the Minister for Parliamentary Business. This is one of our regular sessions with the Minister on the Scottish Government's work relevant to the committee. The Minister is accompanied by three Scottish Government officials. First of all, Karen Auchincloss, Head of the Parliament and Legislation Unit, Gordon Johnson, the Brexit Legislation Manager in the Parliament and the Legislation Unit, and Rachel Rayner, Deputy Legislation Coordinator in the Scottish Government Legal Directorate. May I welcome you all to the meeting. So, first of all, I'd like to remind all those attending this morning not to worry about switching the microphone on and off, because that's done automatically for you. So, first of all, I'd like to invite the Minister to make some opening remarks. Minister. Good morning and thank you, convener, and thank the committee members for asking me along here today. Uh, first of all, it says in my speaking note, I'd like to welcome Jeremy Balfour back to the committee, but Mr Kerr is here as a suitable substitution, and him and I seem to follow each other around this building on a regular basis, so, uh, you know, there's some more Stephen Kerr, George Adam times, never a bad thing. Uh, at any time. But uh, on more serious matters, uh, as we all know, this committee plays a hugely important role in scrutinising all legislation. I welcome the close working relationship we have built up since I became Minister for Parliamentary Business, and I hope that that continues. I do not have to remind you that the first year of this Parliament has been very challenging. It began with the pandemic still a major focus and ended with the situation in the Ukraine. And I would like to record my thanks uh, to the, this committee, its officials, and indeed the Parliament for the constructive way it has worked with the government over extremely busy and challenging time. Despite these challenges, a significant amount of legislation has been introduced. 16 bills, 328 SSIs, 21 LCMs and 32 UK SIs. The government recognises the concern arising from the use of the made affirmative procedure during the pandemic and the committee's inquiry. We have a good record of ministers working with Parliament to establish administrative processes to enhance security, even, when, even where urgent action is required. Further to the committee's recommendation on the made affirmative procedure and enabling powers in the COVID Recovery Reform Scotland Bill specifically, I am pleased that the COVID-19 Recovery Committee has endorsed significant amendments to the bill which strengthens parliamentary safeguards. And I know that the committee is considering a supplementary delegated powers memorandum on the bill at today's meeting. Since becoming Minister for Parliamentary Business, I have come to appreciate the volume and breadth of information that we share, not only with this committee, but with the Parliament as a whole. For example, we provide a forward look every week of SSIs to be laid in the following two weeks, weekly updates on UKSIs and monthly updates on LCMs and monthly updates on Bill. It may be the case that there is still further information that we could uh, helpfully share. Therefore, I have asked my officials to undertake a strategic review of the data and information that we already provide to Parliament. I want to exchange the exchange of information to be as useful and efficient as possible. And, of course, my officials will engage with the Parliament's officials to progress this. And, as always, convener, I look forward to your committee's questions today. Thank you very much, Minister. Uh, just before I go into uh, some areas of questioning that uh, I've got here, but you mentioned there this, this strategic review. Um, can you provide a timeline for that, please? Uh, probably, I, off the top of my head, probably can't give you the timeline at this stage, but I'll maybe bring in Karen that will give you some more detail on it. Hi, 
Yes, yeah, so it's at an early stage, as Mr Adams says, there's been such a lot of information that has flowed between government and parliament in the last couple of years. Brexit, the pandemic, so um, Mr Adams is wanting us to take a bit of a kind of stock check, to pause um, and start work with parliamentary officials just to make sure that the information we're providing is, is helpful, it's adding value, there's no duplication. So it's at an early stage, but we'd hope to pick up the work over summer recess. And from our perspective, it's to make sure the information we're giving you is of value, as I said in my opening note, and you can actually make sure that there's no point in us giving you data for data's sake. It's something you can actually use and it will help you and aid you with your work. No, thank you for that. Um, I think it would be quite useful uh, if um, if there can be some regular dialogue between your officials and uh, and the, the clerking team of the committee. If that's yeah. Okay. That goes without saying, and they already have a very good working relationship with each yeah. other, as I've already previously yeah. said, and it's one that we we want to make yeah. sure, because this committee is an extremely, uh, you know, the, there's quite a workload that you have, and it's quite detailed, so that relationship is really important for both sides. Yeah. Indeed. Well, thank you for that. Um, so, just in terms of the, uh, you touched upon the, the COVID um, uh, paper that we will actually be discussing uh, later on uh, this morning. But uh, regarding the um, COVID legislation, are the, the Scottish Government have any further uh, proposals or plans for legislation, uh, whether primary or secondary, um, later in this session? Uh, currently, uh, we've got the bill that's going through Parliament as we speak. Probably there may be an SSI in September at one point, but uh, it's as and when we need it, if we need it. So at this stage, there's nothing uh, in tablets of stone. OK. Uh, so the committee has previously called for an impact assessment on those affected by the made affirmative SSI and Minister's plans to publicise its content and implications to be included with the explanation of the reason for the urgency of the SSI. The Scottish Government has since said that it considers that, and I quote, current uh, scrutiny frameworks are fit for purpose. Can you, Minister, provide an update on what steps the Government will actually take to ensure that it provides the Parliament with a clear assessment of the impact of any instruments made using the made affirmative procedure? Well, there's a number of things here uh, with regards to uh, ensuring that you get uh, give the reasons for uh, using the, the uh, affirmative process. Uh, it's something we already do. It's something that's part of the, came in at stage two of the current coronavirus bill as well. Uh, so we make sure that that's an ongoing issue for us all as well. But it's the usual process and it's the relationships that we have with yourselves to make sure that we can make that work. And that's been an important thing. So all in all, uh, I think we're already doing it. Uh, and we just need to make sure that we retain these relationships, keep working that way. OK. Um, and also, certain just on that same kind of area, in March, the government provided a response to the committee's made affirmative inquiry, uh, with a number of items still being considered by the government. Uh, can you provide an update or a written update uh, to the various strands of work uh, about that particular summary? Yep, uh, this is ongoing work for us in the Parliament. You know, it never stops, mm. effectively. We're always going to have to look at better ways of ensuring that we can work uh, with yourself as a committee mm -hmm. and make things happen. So uh, there's not an actual definitive... There's, I would say there's not a, never an end to uh, this type of work, but uh, the short answer would be yes. We'll write to you over the summer period uh, to uh, just to update you on where we are with everything. OK, well, thank you. Uh, Paul? Okay. So, yeah, I, I Thank you, convener. I wonder, Minister, um, in terms of, you know, made affirmative at one time would have been something that was a really, really rare occurrence in Parliament. Uh, obviously, during the pandemic, it became a much more frequent used way of bringing regulation into being. Um, what is the government's position in relation to the use of made affirmative? What is the current thinking around when and how it should be used, if ever? Well, basically, in the very simplistic terms, Mr Kerr, made affirmative should be used when it's needed. You know, when we do need to get emergency legislation through. Uh, and other times, uh, as you quite rightly say, over the two last two years, it has been used more than it has previously uh, because of the situation that we found ourselves in. Uh, on the whole, uh, I would probably think it would be pretty flexible. I don't expect that I will be coming to you using the made affirmative 
all the time. I think I said to Mr Simpson when he asked a similar question last year, it wouldn't be my number one uh, choice in going forward with legislation, but sometimes needs must. And uh, you need to go down this route in order to deliver what you want to deliver. But on the whole, uh, I'm, try I'm quite happy to work within the normal procedures that we have. But when I have to, I have to. It's just that when a certain practice becomes common, it can be an easy go-to. And I think what I'm looking for is an assurance that the government still regard this as a very rare way of bringing regulation into being. I would say it is a rare way of bringing legislation into being and it wouldn't be my go-to uh, way to do legislation. Okay, just before bringing in Mr Simpson, um, I'm, Mr Kerr, I'm, I'm sure you'll be aware of the inquiry that the committee undertook and the debate we had in the chamber. Um, and I think certainly since I think that period of time, I think, it's the, I think the number of uh, made affirmatives <coughs> have certainly reduced mm -hmm. uh, in this committee and also in the parliament, which certainly has been, uh, has been useful, isn't it? Mr Simpson. Thanks, convener. Um, yeah, you, you're absolutely right that the number of made affirmatives has, has tailed off. Um, uh, and Minister, you know this committee's view that we, we think it should be uh, a last resort and, and that if anything you should be using the affirmative procedure. So on that note, uh, you'll, you'll know that there are discussions ongoing uh, to develop a protocol for using the affirmative procedure in order that uh, that could be used, uh, shall we say, more speedily, so that would allow uh, Parliament to use the affirmative procedure um, in a truncated time scale. So wh where are we with that? Well, these are ongoing discussions between ourselves and parliamentary authorities to try and find the most, uh, the, the best way for us to be able to work together. So that will be kind of an ongoing issue. I'll maybe get Karen to give us an update on any of that, if it's possible. Yeah, so we've been sharing a draft of the protocol with um, the clerks of this committee. We're probably likely to have a meeting in the next couple of weeks, but we are really aiming to finalise it as soon as we can. Don't want to hold it up. OK. Um... Well, the, the committee's not seen that yet, so... Mm. I, 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 and oh. you'll be the first to see it, Mr. Simpson. Okay, lovely. Yeah, as Thank I say, you. It's, very much just, it's a sort of working draft uh, that we're just engaging early on. OK. OK. OK, thank you. OK. Mr. Sweeney. Uh, thank you, um, convener, and thank you to the Minister for coming along today uh, and his colleagues. I um, want to ask primarily around the quality of drafting. Um, whilst the number of errors the committee highlights in SSIs generally tends to be quite low and fairly minor in nature, um, the committee still regularly identifies drafting issues. So what is the Minister doing to ensure that the quality of FS F SSIs remains high? Uh, we want to continue the good work we have been doing uh, to make sure that there are less uh, mistakes and problems. One of the, and you'll be perfectly aware of this, as Mr Sweeney has been on this committee for the past year or so as well, is uh, sometimes some of the areas are so complex that inevitably there will be errors uh, and mistakes made. But we've tried to make sure that we don't have that problem. And when we do see it, we, we correct the error as soon as possible. I think there's been a couple of times where your committee has highlighted some errors and uh, to me that makes the systems working uh, and we managed to kind of correct it within uh, the times that we need to do that. But on the whole, I'd like to get to a place where there's uh, as little errors as possible because we are making law after all. Mm. That's helpful. Also, just to ask about the um, effort to put more explanatory notes in relation to SSIs. Um, I know the government's committed to um, doing that in the response to our reports. Um, and it says that the government sort of asserts that it always does this, but clearly we've highlighted this as a major concern about the plain English explanations for rationales on it. Um, can the Minister respond further about how more effort we've put into making sure these are legible for the, for the non-legally trained person? Yeah, the, the government would always try and uh, make sure that there's plain English and there's the, the explanatory notes are understandable, but I get it from your position as someone who used to be in this committee as well. I understand that sometimes uh, you can look at things and, you know, you're trying to, someone will point out to you, well, that's what that SSI means. You go, oh, right, I've read it twice and I never actually thought that, you know. So, yeah, I'm aware that there can be uh, these issues. And as always, the government will do what it can 
to ensure that we can make sure it's as uh, uh, drafted the correct way, but also at the end of the day, uh, understandable to those that are doing it. I don't know if Karen wants to add anything on top of that. Or? Um, I suppose most SSIs are accompanied by a policy note, and I think that's the opportunity for us to try and explain, uh, as you say, in plain English. I think we try our best to do that um, for some complex SSI sometimes we can't get away from the use of legalese for a you know want of a better phrase but um, we do try as much as we can to set out in the policy note uh, the rationale and explain what any instrument does. One thing from a personal point of view when I first got involved in government all the acronyms and everything else that's been used for everything became a bit of a shock so I'm aware that you know we need to try and make sure that things are in plain English for us all so that I don't get into a place where I'm understanding government lingo and uh, we're basically not getting our uh, point of view across. I suppose it might be difficult to preempt understanding um, particularly if you're so used to, to dealing with these issues so sometimes you don't you can't anticipate what other people might not understand. So uh, perhaps there is an effort from this committee to feed back more regularly on areas yeah. where there are difficulties in terms of it. That, that would be very helpful, Mr Sweeney. That gives us the opportunity to be able to actually, you know, just see that... Because some things... If you don't tell us, uh, then we're not going to uh, know what the problem is and we're just going to continue doing the same thing. So that would be helpful. Okay. Right. Thanks very much. Okay. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Um, Mr Kerr. Yeah, we're all for plain English. Um, that's for sure. Um, of course, I wasn't in the last parliament, but in session five, um, I think your predecessor habitually would, and rather helpfully, would write to subject committees indicating the volume of SSIs that, that they might be able to anticipate that are heading in their direction. But that practice appears to have ended. So what was the reason for the discontinuation of that practice in and is it something that could be revived? I came in and said, I'm not having any of that. No, I'm only joking. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, no, uh, we, we actually are looking at, as, as I said earlier on, when we're looking at a strategic review, we're actually looking at the opportunity of what is a better way of working with committee, what is a better way of ensuring that information is getting over to the committee. So it's something that we'll look at. Uh, within that strategic review and uh, maybe come back to the committee and others when we've got a, you know, because as I said earlier on, we're literally going to take a step back, have a look at everything and see what's working, what's not. And uh, if we can, if we're working along with yourselves, we think that this is a way forward, we'll look at that as well. You did produce a table, I remember very vividly, a very colourful table that indicated the number of SS. This was some months ago, perhaps at the beginning of the session, actually. I think that may have been a bureau paper right at the very beginning. Ah, right. I mean, that would be something that I think people would probably find very, very mm -hmm. useful. Um, can you indicate what you anticipate the volume of SSIs looks like between now and the end of the year? We're probably looking... See, this is, uh, this is me paint myself into a corner, if I give you an actual figure. Uh, but uh, we're looking at 40-ish between now and the end of the year. 40-ish, that could be 41, could be 42, it could be 39. You know, uh, so we're there or thereabouts, depending on how things go and what happens. Events, dear boy, events can kind of take over and uh, give us uh, to change things as well. So we're looking about 40-ish with the emphasis on ish. We, we of course, would delight for the human error, the margin of human error that you're, you're, you're describing, and I applaud you quoting Harold Macmillan, but, <laughs> <laughs> but um, would it be possible to provide some greater detail in terms of where those SSI, SSIs fall, uh, particularly for the benefit of the subject committees? Yeah, I'll bring in uh, Karen if you want. Yeah, happy to take that way and consider and see what would work best for you, but we'll give you as much indication as we can about what's coming and when it's coming. Right. That's very fine. Thank you. OK, thank you. Um, Mr Beattie. Thank you, Convener. Um, Minister, I'd, I'd like to ask just a couple of questions about uh, secondary legislation uh, stemming from the UK's withdrawal from the EU. Now, normally we'd be asking about how many instruments would be considered under the SSI protocol, but uh, I think the committee welcomes the fact that this has been discontinued. Can you give any notification on how many... SI notifications departments, notifications departments likely to receive between now and the end of the year. And you answered to Mr Kerr about the number you anticipated being laid. Would you have a figure? 
figure or oh, be probably again around about 15 for that in particular. Uh, one of the one of the challenges we have with uh, some of the UK uh, government kind of situations where we actually receive the information and how long it takes for it to get to us. Uh, so that gives us that kind of slows up the process. But on the whole, we're looking at probably 15. I've noticed actually on other committees where SSIs and so on have come forward that uh, well, where they're coming from the UK the SI notifications coming from the UK government, they they do tend to be very short in terms of the timing for the Parliament to, uh, committee in the Parliament to look at it. Uh, is there any way that can be made better? Or are we entirely in the hands of uh, how quickly the UK government notifies? us? Mr. Beatty, we are in the hands of how quickly the UK government. Uh, notifiers but in my scenario I've tried to be my usual charming self uh, and trying to work with them in a constructive manner in order to get to make the business flow uh, but that can be quite challenging like we've got the UK retained EU law uh, bill that will be coming out at one point now we don't know what it does we don't know what it will do you know so that's quite concerning because that's a big massive piece of work uh, so that'd be an example of that may or may not affect the number of uh, SIs that we would have going through from this, pers this the pers questions that you ask. So uh, that could be quite kind of challenging for us. Uh, I'll maybe bring in Gordon at this point, since this is his area of expertise, uh, to maybe give you some more detail. Yeah, thank, thank you, Minister. Yeah, we have 15 SI notifications we're anticipating uh, between now and Christmas, and that information comes from two sources. Um, a forward look we get from Cabinet Office and a forward look from DEFRA. And given that uh, most of the EU exit SIs we've notified recently have been from DEFRA, we're pretty sure that's likely to be a fairly accurate figure, although uh, every time we get a new iteration, it does tend to vary slightly. It goes up and down, but it's sitting at 15 at the moment. We may be talking about the same figure here, but given that the power to correct deficiencies uh, in the retained EU laws due to end at the end of the year or sunset at the end of the year, however you want to call it. Can you give an indication of how many deficiency related SSIs or SI notifications under SI Protocol 2 the Parliament's likely to receive before that time? A technical question, so I'll bring in Gordon again. Oh, that is the same figure. It's the that is the same. Figure. I suspect that it might be, yeah. but just, just good to have that clarification. Just to make clear that um, the SI protocol is wider than just efficiency fixes. It now covers a lot more sort of um, post-Brexit legislation. So um, the protocol will continue to have a use even when the deficiency fixing power has, has, has gone. A lot of the SIs we're notifying now aren't just about deficiency fixes. It, it's moving on to dealing with that post-Brexit world. So you're anticipating that this will continue after yes. the end of the year? Yes. Um, the, the protocol applies to uh, various powers um, that um, were within sort of EU competence before, okay. before exit and now how they've transferred into domestic legislation and where they're used, the protocol applies. It is much broader than just um, deficiency fixes. Do we have any understanding of what the, what the, the volumes might be or is that just on a, more on an ad hoc basis coming coming from the uh, UK government? Um, yes, and also there can be discussions about whether it, we think it's more appropriate to use a UK SI or an SSI. So th there's, there's lots of discussions that go into um, bringing forward an SI notification. Which, which leads perhaps to the next, or my last question, which is, what work is there ongoing or planned by the Scottish Government to, to simplify some of the complexity within EU law. Presumably there's discussions going on with the UK government in this respect. As always, there will be ongoing discussion with the UK government, but one of the main points I explained to you earlier on is there's the example of the UK retained uh, EU law bill. Whatever shape that takes could be a major issue for us or give us some kind of problems in so much as we don't know what it is. So it could affect us from that point of view as well. 
Okay, so we've just no idea what. The, the, is there any discussions on that? Any cooperation on the development of that bill? Uh, it's not in my time as Minister for Parliamentary Business. There hasn't been much in the way of cooperation and anything like that. So uh, it's probably it's probably more likely to be that we will receive the information uh, probably uh, before it's published, or j might just before it's published, or when it is published. That doesn't sound like a great deal of time for us to scrutinise it. Either as a parliament or a committee. And it does. Uh, it does make it challenging, uh, Mr. Beatty. Thank you, Okay, Mr. Kerr. Uh, I noticed you said that you you're not directly involved in any discussions with the UK government with the contents or methodology that will be applied with the proposed EU retain law bill. But does that exclude the possibility that there are other parts of the Scottish government that might be talking to their counterparts in the UK government in order to assess? What, what it would actually mean? Officials, officials will always be, dial, uh, be in dialogue with each other from the UK government yes. and the Scottish government all the time. Uh, there will be dialogue there, there will be dialogue at ministerial level. But what I am saying is that the difficulty comes when it comes to publication of said bill or whatever. Mm -hmm. We do get it at the very last minute. So then we end up with a whole process where this committee, for example, is quite rightly waiting for us to kind of give the information or want to say you were the one that was scrutinising said bill. You won't be in this case, but say you were, uh, you know, the, you'd be wanting us to get the information to you as quickly as possible mm. uh, so you could scrutinise it. Whereas at the same time, my officials need to sit back. Rachel needs to make sure it's legal from our perspective, you know, and uh, uh, kind of works with Scots law. Gordon needs to go through absolutely everything as well. And Karen as a whole and the head of PLU needs to make sure that we've got a spot in the parliament to make sure we can do that. Now, that all works perfectly when there is this kind of uh, ongoing respect where we will get it earlier. I don't know if recently this is a new thing. In my time, it's always been getting everything at the last minute. I don't know if Karen or anyone can tell us if there was another before time when we might have got things uh, sooner. Um, I probably couldn't answer in the before time because I've only recently taken up this post, but I'm happy to go away um, and look into that. I think Mr Adams quite right. We do seek to have you know early engagement with the UK government uh, all the time at an official level. Um, it, it can sometimes be tricky because we don't maybe see things uh, you know until the very last minute. But um, yeah, where we can seek to engage and influence, we always do that. Can I just seek a point of clarification uh, with what you just said there, Karen, when you said that you sometimes don't see things at last minute? Is that at official level as well as at ministerial level? Uh, Gordon might be able to help, um, but I think there, I, what I would say is there's probably, it depends on the area, there might be better engagement and a free flow of information, I think it depends on which part um, and what you get to see, but I don't know if Gordon, because you've been doing this longer than I have. Yeah, I think there's a particular issue with the bills that were introduced just right after the Queen's speech. Uh, so in those cases, colleagues are quite often seeing provisions um, on the day of introduction in some cases or the day before introduction. Um, and if it's a big and complicated bill, then that makes it very difficult to meet the, the two-week target in standing orders for, for lodging an LCA. OK, well, that's helpful. Thank you. OK, um, Mr Sweeney. Thank you, convener. I uh, just want to turn to historical commitments um, that have been pursued by predecessor committees. Um, certainly our um, predecessor committee had welcomed the Scottish Government's work in meeting almost all of its historic commitments by the end of the last parliamentary session. So the longest standing commitment is now the Education Listed Body Scotland Order 2018, which is SSI 2018-7. What is the Government doing to ensure it meets this and other outstanding commitments? Well, I'm glad, Mr Sweeney, you've said that we have managed to deal with a lot of the historical commitments, predecessor committees. Uh, the, the simple answer is we're still committed to make sure that we do uh, get, get this work done. Uh, some of the things have just been uh, ongoing. I, ironically, I kind of thought this may be a question because I asked, you know, what do we have on the decks? What are still there? What we need to, what can we get done and clear out? And it's one of the things that I would like to do. But as in all things in life, sometimes some things are a wee bit more complicated than others. Can I just ask what procedure you follow to kind of keep pace or keep attention, positive tension within the team to make sure that's constantly being challenged about how rapidly how this has been progressed? You know? Well, I hate to say it in front of them, but I've actually got a very good team. 
You know, I don't want their heads to get too big here, but uh, no, I've been supported. Uh, they're, they're pretty focused on making sure that they do their job uh, and make sure that we uh, produce all the work we need to get done. Uh, as you can understand, in the Parliamentary Legislation Unit, it's quite a... Well, it's much like the remit you've got here. You know, it's quite detailed. There's quite a lot ongoing. It's almost like Saturday night variety plate spinning. You know, where you've got one still going, you've just got to get them all going. So uh, it's in the list of priorities, the historical cases uh, that we have to try and get done. Will it get done tomorrow or the next day? Probably a wee bit longer than that. There, there has been reasons why that one in particular you mentioned has been uh, taking as long as it has. And sort of in relation to that, turning to the Scottish Law Commission uh, bills, um, I know there's quite the reservoir sitting on, um, waiting oh. to be brought forward to, to legislation. Um, and I often think, you know, government time could perhaps be used more efficiently to, to drive that forward yeah. rather than debating motions without any legislative effect, for example. Uh, you know, it would be good to try and utilise th these fantastic pieces of legislation in the interests of, of the country. And rather than being the model United Nations, you know. <laughs> uh, so um, uh, just to, to that end, um, the committee is looking forward to scrutinising the Movable Transaction Scotland Bill. And as highlighted in the most recent programme for government, the implementation of a number of other SLC reports are being considered for session six. So could you update the committee on what legislation is in the pipeline and the timescale for introduction? And could you give an indication also on how many of these legacy reports will be brought forward onto the statute books this session? Well, this time last year, when I first came to this committee, uh, my uh, Cairns predecessor uh, said to me that uh, the Movable Transactions Bill was uh, a perfect example of the government working with SLC to ensure that we get that forward. Then that bill became quite difficult and complex. It's a very complex technical bill in itself. And so much so that I said to Cairns uh, predecessor that uh, I called it the unmovable uh, objects bill because it just didn't seem to move. I sat here, committed myself to the committee, saying that we're going to go forward with that, and then we hit difficulty uh, in so much that there was quite a lot of issues that had to be solved. I don't know if, Rachel, you'll be able to add anything to that with the movable transactions, as an example. Yeah, I think I think issues have been resolved, and yeah, uh -huh. we're pleased to be able to um, get that introduced. But, but it's an example of the difficulties and complexities that we yeah. have with some of these bills, SLC bills, as they come forward. Yeah, there are. Yeah, there can be a lot of challenges, as you will have seen. It's a very technical area, so we need to make sure that everything is right before the bill's presented to Parliament. So, uh, so what I'm saying is, yes, uh, I, I do want to try and see, can I give you exactly how many that I'm planning to work with at this moment? The answer would be no, but we're quite happy to ongo and look at that to see where we could be. Uh, maybe this one in particular has made me a bit nervous because it just seemed to take forever after I told every one of you here a year ago that that was one that you're going to do. Now, from your perspective, this is so technical that uh, my hell will now be your <laughs> hell when you're dealing with it because uh, effectively you've got to be careful what you wish for as the committee because uh, it's coming to your committee and it's going to be one, it's going to be a challenging bill for you all to deal with. And I don't doubt for a minute you'll deal with it, but it will be a challenging bill for you. <laughs> <laughs> you never lose it as a salesperson. Well, so I'm sure we're up for getting stuck into it. Um, just wanted to ask another supplementary on that. Um, just to keep an eye on progress, would it be possible to have a grid of outstanding bills and, and reports and a, a view of where the government's position is on bringing it forward to, to, to you know, what the status of it is, just so we have an actual indicator of bill and, you know, who, you know, the anticipated status and when we might see it reach Personally. the Parliament, you know, just so we've got that kind of oversight of what's there, because it is, I mean, it's a huge body of, you know, it's a lot of public money's going into developing these, you know, it seems mm -hmm. like a, an inefficient thing, just have them sitting, gathering dust, you know, so it might be good just to have that oversight so we can see actually that's been two years, what's going on, you know, yeah. and we can from time to time just revisit it. I, uh, I always thought we shared that information, but if we don't, then... Maybe, that, forgive me if we don't, but... Uh, uh, but uh, if we uh, don't, then it's quite as part of the process of uh, deciding how, what information we share with you and what we don't. We can take note of that and make sure that we include that in the, the, the look of what we're going to do. Thank you. That's appreciated. Helpful, thank you. Um, just before I bring in um, Graham Simpson, just I want to get back to the, the issue regarding historic commitments, because uh, certainly in the last session, I mean, at one point there was a 
a whole plethora of historic commitments signed to this committee. Um, really kind of pressed the government to uh, to make some improvements there, and, and the government certainly did. Um, so obviously this one is just the outstanding, and it has been, <coughs> excuse me, it has been there obviously for uh, for a number of years. Clearly, the Brexit's happened, the COVID pandemic, uh, but can you provide just um, an indication uh, as to when uh, when you think the government actually will actually have this? Particular commitment. Undertaken. Probably my best bet would to get back to you in writing on that one, okay. just to give me a chance to have a proper look at it. Because uh, when I was asking, I just got the information this morning with regards to uh, this bill in particular. So if you give me some time to get back to you, and I'll write to you on it. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Simpson. Thanks, convener. Um, just, just, um, just a comment really on the the Scottish Law Commission. You'll know we work we work uh, closely with them as 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 we work closely with yourself. Uh, and yeah, you know, there has been that frustration over over a number of years from them, um, which Mr. Sweeney's highlighted about the the, the amount of work that they put into de developing uh, these proposals and. As Mr. Sweeney said, a lot of them just sit and gather, gather dust. Um, so, I think from this committee's point of view, it would be useful uh, if we could have some kind of timetable uh, from yourself. And even if it's just to say we're not going to, you know, there's no chance of progressing that one or that that one. Yes, there's a there's an opportunity there. Uh, and you're right about the movable. I'm happy. I'm happy to look at that, Mr. Simpson. That, that's good. That would be really useful. Um, you're quite right about the movable transactions bill. I had a quick look at it. And it's uh, it's quite daunting, <laughs> but we'll we'll get stuck into it and we'll do a proper job on it. Um, my area of questioning is uh, really around something that you mentioned earlier and your frustration uh, and your officials' frustration uh, about having very little time to scrutinise UK bills. Uh, but we've found the same thing. Uh, with with Scottish bills, in fact, we had a, a case last week uh, with the, the Good Food Nation bill. Uh, this committee received a letter the day before the stage three debate, um, telling us about uh, possible new powers related to uh, the establishment of a food food commissioner. Uh, so we just had no time to consider that, and then again today. As you, as you said earlier, we'll be looking at the, the, the coronavirus bill following stage two. Stage three amendments have to be laid by uh, noon today. And we're, we're only discussing it at, at this meeting. So if this committee decided we thought that there, there should be an amendment, probably by the end of this meeting, we'll have less than an hour to do that. Now, that's not really acceptable, is it? I think on the whole, uh, Mr Simpson, my preferred option would be, uh, if there's a hard way and an easy way, I will take the easier way, which would be to make sure everything goes as per normal. Sometimes, uh, because of circumstances, and sometimes like in the Good Food Nation example, where something came out or at stage two, uh, with regards to the debate, uh, then you know changes are made. But I take on board the point of view you're saying, uh, with regards to you would like more time and scrutiny. I want to come here and actually you not say, you know, Minister, uh, you're not giving me enough time for scrutiny because, as I said to you last year, my job is effectively process and to make sure that process goes uh, through uh, smoothly. And, uh, you know, I would probably prefer if we're in a situation, but as I've said with other answers, there's always circumstance where you end up, if you use the example of LCMs, as an example, you know, it becomes difficult. We end up in that process again where UK government's given me them at the last minute. My officials are trying to find out uh, if they're good, proper, if they can fit into Scots law, if everyone's OK, if we can actually, uh, everyone's right with it. And then we've got to make sure that the parliament can scrutinise as well. And it's trying to get all that at the one time. If one, it's like a domino effect, effectively. You know, once the dominoes start, they all start falling down. But, you know, sometimes we need a wee bit we need a, a few packs of dominoes so that we can actually, uh, to, to, to kill my metaphor even further, uh, you know, uh, to uh, be able to actually uh, to be able to actually do the job properly. And that means the UK government giving us a lot more time. 
Yeah, well, I wasn't talking about the UK government. I, I know, talking, but I'm just saying talking about you, Mr Adam. Yes, and, and I'm and saying I, I'm it, aware of the Food Commission one in the stage three debate when it came yeah. up, and I'm aware of the situation. On the whole, I uh, would have, have preferred if we maybe had more time at that stage, yes. But sometimes things do change at stage two and three. And as a whole, I try not to truncate the legislative process. There have been examples in the past year, uh, but on the whole, I try not to. So... With, with regard to the coronavirus bill, why are we only getting, you know, why are we only considering this today when today is the deadline for stage three amendments? That doesn't, that you know, frankly, that doesn't give this committee enough time to properly do its work. Mr Simpson, with a great respect, I can only talk about process and parliamentary business policy, and that's not my remit. So I'm not talking about be... policy. I'm talking but about the, the pl policy... planning and a time scale. But the development of the uh, policy itself uh, and how it gets to that position is what takes the time. But this, it, the, my question is not about policy. It is about giving this committee enough time to deal with whatever is in front of it. I haven't mentioned the policy behind mm -hmm. the bill. And on the whole, Mr Simpson, we do. Uh, there are the odd times where you have situations like this and sometimes we just need to uh, kind of move forward. And, and it's entirely up to this committee to decide one way or the other, uh, when it has its discussion after I've left. We don't set the timescale, Minister, you do. So it just needs to improve. We shouldn't be in this position. I'm it. suitably chastised, mm. Mr Simpson. Mm. OK, thank you, Mr Simpson. Uh, Mr Kerr. So the committee, um, the committee, Minister, as you know, has a long-standing interest in the scrutiny of bills which confer powers in devolved areas to UK ministers and then the scrutiny of the exercise of those powers, I think it would be informative to understand what considerations inform Scottish ministers' decisions to recommend consent for UK bills which confer delegated powers on UK ministers in devolved areas. Okay, on the whole, uh, Mr Kerr, most of that's done on a uh, LCM by LCM basis. Uh, we have to look at the, the kind of basis of that LCM and how it affects uh, Scotland and devolution in itself. But uh, again, I go back to part of the process and all that has been the difficulty that we've had with regards to things and some occasions officials no matter how good the relationships have been with UK officials, uh, the first time they have seen it and ministers have seen it has been on publication of uh, LCM. And if it's not on the publication of the LCM, then we've seen it uh, maybe a day beforehand. And that doesn't give us the kind of time and scope to be able to do the work that we need to do to ensure that we can... Uh, Again, it goes back to the whole kind of uh, scrutiny scenario where we need to ensure we do that. But on each and every uh, LCM, it's done on an LCM by LCM basis. And uh, the, dec the decision will be made on how it affects us either from a legal perspective or how it affects us uh, from a policy perspective uh, over that period as well. So presumably... So Presumably, Scottish ministers have a template of the sorts of questions you've just alluded to. Um, you've, you, I say you've alluded to because it, it, is there more detail you can give us about what those considerations are? When you see a bill that comes from the UK Parliament and it confers delegated powers to UK ministers in devolved areas, is there a checklist set of criteria or sort of questions that you then say, right, let's have a look at this and see whether or not we can ultimately recommend to the Scottish Parliament that we, you know, a legislative consent motion for that piece of legislation. What? Just talk us through that with a little bit more detail. I feel I've already explained the government's position with regards to that, Mr Kerr, but always one for giving good value, uh, convener. I'll maybe ask Rachel from her perspective uh, when we're going through that process, what would you be looking at? Well, we'd be, um, as the Minister said, we're um, looking at lots of different factors, what we think is appropriate, what we think, in, you know, it, yeah, what in, in the circumstances, looking at the type of area it is, how the law works, whether we think that is would be an appropriate power. Is there also looking at, are we retaining an option for ministers 
for Scottish ministers to make um, their SS, uh, an SSI as an alternative, you know, yeah, looking at what is most appropriate in the particular circumstances of that bill. Maybe, Gordon, could you say something from the perspective of the work that you do? Does that affect your...? I can't add uh, much to what Rachel's just said. It's um, If there's powers in a bill that give uh, powers for UK ministers to legislate in devolved areas, then the ask from us would always be to have a consent lock, so the consent of Scottish ministers is required. Um, or to have concurrent powers so we can do our own um, SSI, as Rachel said, in that area. But uh, those requests, um, well, of, of late, have been falling on deaf ears, I think it would be fair to say. So we're asking for those, thing, those things, but we're not getting them. Yeah, so there are, there are UK bills where UK ministers have delegated powers that they can use without reference to Scottish ministers. Uh, they fall out with the scope of SI protocol 2. So, a couple of questions for the Minister then. I'd be very interested to hear his views. How might the Scottish Parliament scrutinise proposals by UK ministers to exercise powers, uh, as well as the Scottish Minister's <coughs> position on those proposals? <coughs> well, it's, as I said earlier on, Mr Kerr, the, the situation we have is uh, when the LCM comes in, the decision has to be made how it affects us, the Scottish Government, and how we deal with it and how it affects the legislation. So when we are going through the whole process ourselves, we have to ensure that uh, we've got everything covered. And uh, I, I think what you're looking for, Mr Kerr, is, is there actually, like you said it yourself, a template uh, to cut and paste on every single LCM. I'm trying to say, and both my officials have tried to say, is that there isn't a template like that because everything's different and everything can be sometimes it can be more complex than others and other times it is quite simple where we actually there is a, isn't an issue but recently more often than not there have been issues and uh, we have had to do something within uh, do an SSI and do something within the Scottish Parliament yeah, I, I, no I'm not I'm not I, I'm not asking you to copy and paste anything I mean, but I am, I suppose, yeah, I'm actually looking for a ruler against which you measure a bill and the provisions in it that allow UK ministers to exercise uh, well, the legal rule, rights in devolved areas. The rule, Mr Kerr, would be legislative competence in Scotland. Right. OK, I, yeah. Can I come back to my question, though, because you've answered the question from a governmental perspective, mm -hmm. but as the Minister for Parliamentary Business, I was asking about how might the Scottish Parliament scrutinise? Do you have a view on that? How might we scrutinise proposals by UK Ministers to exercise powers um, that have been conferred to them through UK bills, which have had the consent of the Scottish Government and the Scottish Parliament? I think on the whole, from my own experience as a backbencher and... Uh, within committees like this one. Uh, I think uh, we do get that option to look at the information as it comes uh, from the government, uh, from there, because you, you will be aware that there's an LCM, uh, you will be aware that the LCM comes through, and you will be aware when the SSI comes through as well. So there's all these checks and balances in the parliament there to be able to do that uh, as is. Again, if there's a better way of looking at it, I think that's what you're trying to... Uh, hint at Mr Kerr. If there is a better way, then I'm quite open to look at a better way to make that happen and might be uh, it might be more transparent for the uh, committees and the parliament itself. I'm quite happy to look at that and any suggestions from others could be part of uh, our process uh, that we're looking into with regards to the information we provide backwards and forwards to the committee. Yeah, and I think one of the issues that you've touched on, which, which, which I would agree with, and I'm sure other members of the committee would agree with, is that that there is uh, an adequate opportunity to scrutinise in advance, um, and, and and that is a theme that's come up time and time again this morning um, in relation to matters general, not just specific to, to, to UK ministers having powers to legislate in devolved areas, but across the board. Um, so I think actually I'd probably leave it at that, Convener. Well, it's always a good thing, Mr Kerr, I agree with each other.
more often than you might credit. And that's on the official report now. <laughs> <laughs> the both of you are quoted. It's been, it's been written me. down by my colleague. <laughs> that's me killed in Paisley now. <laughs> I think I'll have a discussion with the presiding officer just to make it aware. <laughs> um, so certainly thank you very much for that. It's uh, just, uh, Mr Kerr, just to make you aware, I mean, your, your point regarding the, the scrutiny of the LCMs, that, that actually is something that this committee has, uh, mm -hmm. is very much active to. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and we've had dialogue about that because it, it's, it, it's a, a valid question and it's something we, uh, we know there is an issue there. Okay. Uh, so any other questions for the Minister or his team? No, okay. Uh, Minister uh, and your colleagues, I'd like to thank you for your attendance to the committee uh, this morning. Thank you. And I think generally it's the, the regular uh, sessions that, uh, that we do have uh, are very helpful by way of the, certainly this committee's work uh, and, uh, and certainly also in terms of the, uh, the, the way we actually work with the Scottish Government. So thank you very much for that. Can I just add, uh, if there are anything, uh, my door's always open for members of the committee or whatever, just to contact us and uh, we can discuss anything offline uh, that they may have. As I've often said, and people say it will come back to bite me, uh, I don't believe I have a monopoly in good ideas. So if anyone has any, I'm quite happy to steal it from them. Sorry, work with them on it. <laughs> good. And Minister, thank you very much for that. And I will suspend uh, briefly. Thank you. Under agenda item number four, we are considering instruments as subject to the affirmative procedure. No points have been raised on the Draft Health, Tobacco, Nicotine, etc. and Care Scotland Act 2016, Supplementary Provision Regulations 2022, and the Draft Age of Criminal Responsibility, Reports on the Use of Places of Safety, Scotland Regulations 2022. First of all, is the committee content with these instruments? Yeah. Are there any points on the instruments? No, OK, thank you. And our agenda item number five, we're considering instruments subject to the negative procedure. No points have been raised on SSIs 2022, 201, 202 and 203. Is the committee content with these instruments? Yeah. Okay. And our agenda item number six, we're considering instruments not subject to any parliamentary procedure. No points have been raised on SSIs 2022, 204. Is the committee content with this instrument? Okay, thank you. And with that, I move the committee into private. Thank you.